Imagine, just for a moment, that a medieval peasant was magically transported to the 21st century, dropped right in the middle of Times Square. If you were their tour guide, how would you explain to them the wonders of modern technology? How fundamental do you think you could go with your explanations before their mind would just refuse to comprehend it? It's easy to laugh at the concept, but see if you could do any better than the peasant. How much of computing do you really understand yourself? Could you really reverse engineer even the most basic aspects of a computer? I'm sure many of you might have started with the basics. A computer is a device consisting of zeros and ones, which, when put together, can represent some data or do some cool operations. And from an incredibly high level, you'd definitely be correct. But how many of you could explain the distribution of those bits? How frequent should a bit be a 1 versus a 0? If both states are equally probable, how would you represent that switch? And what if you were in the shoes of the first computer programmers and had to solve this problem? A first attempt at that last question might use nature as a reference. Maybe we could try looking for some natural process that occurred with 50% probability. Say, for example, a lightning storm. If a bolt of lightning was struck on your left, mark it as a 1. Otherwise, mark it as a zero. But obviously, lightning storms aren't very frequent or safe or practical. Even worse, nature's inherent randomness makes true 50-50 scenarios incredibly unlikely. Sure, you can easily find approximations of symmetry. Butterflies are usually visually symmetric. DNA is often derived equally from both parents. And the equinoxes have approximate lengths of day and night equally. But more often than not, there's no guarantee of precision or fairness. Just because nature is constantly throwing out signals of something occurring or not does not make those events that we observe have a 50% probability. That doesn't mean we should give up though. Suppose we wanted to tackle this problem of bit generation by referencing some process in nature that occurs with probability p. We can represent nature's randomness as an unfair coin that lands with heads probability p and tails with probability q equals 1 minus p. Then the question becomes this, can we design some schema such that we can simulate two fair outcomes, i.e. an unbiased coin toss from this inherently biased starting point? We can take advantage of two points of interest here. First, we can use the fact that coin flips are usually independent, even for unfair coins, i.e. the outcome of one coin flip does not impact the outcome of the next coin flip. While this might not always be true in nature, for the sake of abstracting our problem here, we'll let this assumption fly for the video. Second, we use the multiplication rule. If two events are independent, then the probability of both events occurring together is the product of their individual probabilities. With this, the answer becomes very straightforward. Let's flip the coin twice. The probability of getting the outcome heads tails is p times q, while the probability of getting the outcome tails heads is q times p. These outcomes are equally probable, which matches the fair outcome that we desire. If we ever have a sequence of heads heads or tails tails, we can pretend like we never flip the coin at all and try another sequence of two flips. This works since getting heads heads or tails tails should not impact future probabilities of getting heads tails or tails heads, since we've established that coin flips are independent. Great, now we have a reliable way of generating bits. Let's define a 1 as when we get heads tails and 0 as when we get tails heads. This is also known as von Neumann's strategy. But computers require trillions of bits to be as advanced as they are today. Even with our very naive bare bones computer, we still want some metric of efficiency. Currently, our method of flipping twice and checking the outcomes creates a bit with probability probability 2pq, which means on average, each bit requires 1 over pq flips. While this isn't horrible, is there a way we could do better? After all, if someone did decide to use lightning storms as a baseline model to generate flips for bits, they might not get to generate very many bits before the storm fizzles out. Well, our current method is just throw out what we call bad flips, scenarios where we got heads heads or tails tails. This is obviously inefficient, because there could be hypothetical scenarios where we're just constantly flipping but never actually using the information we receive. What if we reuse these? As as an example, suppose our reference string was heads heads, tails tails, heads tails, tails tails, heads tails, heads heads, tails heads. For each pair, if it's usable, we'll mark it as a 1 or a 0 depending on whether it was heads tails or tails head. If the pair is not usable, we'll move down to the next level. After one pass, this is what we have now. We can see in this initial level 0 that we have 4 unusable bits and 3 usable bits, which get 1, 1, 0. The neat property of the unused bits is that they're uniform. The pair is either both heads or both tails, so what if we just treated it as one flip of heads or tails? Then we can move these results down to the next level. Given this, the next reference string then becomes heads, tails, tails, heads, which, when paired together using von Neumann's strategy, results in 1, 0. These are the bits in level 1. Thus, we can construct our overall bit string by traversing through each level and adding the most significant bits first. Here, our takeaway from our initial string should be 11010. This approach is called the multi-level strategy. It is already far more efficient, since the probability of failing to generate a bit decreases exponentially with the number of flips. More mathematically, after the first 2 to the power of k flips, the probability of not generating a bit is p to the power of 2 to the power of k, plus q to the power of 2 to the power of k. The first value represents only getting heads for the 2 to the power of k flips, while the second one represents getting only tails. Then, the average number of flips per bit approaches what's called 
called the entropy base limit, or negative p times log base 2 of p minus q times log base 2 of q. If you're curious about where this value comes from, I'll attach further readings in the description, but the math is too complex to cover for this video. Either way, all we really care about is that every pair of flips will eventually be guaranteed to become a bit given enough overall flips with this strategy. So now our computer can somewhat efficiently generate bits and simulate fair outcomes. Hooray! But real computers also have to simulate randomness too. From chatbots to cryptography and security to simulations to gaming, it would be really nice if our computer could handle the necessity for randomness. We've developed the ability to generate fair outcomes, so how can we use this to then generate predictably unfair outcomes? Following our previous abstractions, we can rephrase this question as follows. Given a fair coin, how can we generate a game scenario where the game wins with probability p? Mind you, this value of p has to be exact. It's very easy to approximate a solution, but remember, we're pretending like we're the first computer scientists here. If these computers we make for the future have faulty approximations, that opens up a world of backdoors into national secrets, confidential finances, and military technologies. At first, this problem seems almost impossible. After all, getting statistically exact probabilities with just a coin feels so limited. But we can actually solve this problem using a few neat tricks. Take a moment to pause the video and try for yourself. Assuming everyone is ready, we can now proceed with the solution. First, we need a bit of terminology. Call a uniform a b random variable one that can take any value between a and b with equal probability. So for example, u distributed unif 0, 1 means that the value of u, our random variable, could be any value that is greater than 0 or less than 1. Meanwhile, a Bernoulli random variable takes only the values of 0 and 1 with some probability. It models a single yes, no, or success failure trial. This means that if we map the outcome of our coin flips to the values 0 and 1 for tails and heads respectively, and call that a random variable s, then s is distributed burn 0.5. Now our problem can be written as follows. Given in the random variable s, how can we generate a random variable u such that u is distributed unif 0, 1, and if the value u crystallizes to is less than or equal to p, then we return 1, otherwise we return 0. For relating these two variables, you can observe that every number can be written in binary notation expressed as a power of 2. You might reasonably ask, what does it mean to express a fraction in base 2 then? Well, we can write out what the definition of base 10 means. Suppose we have the decimal value of 0 0.25. In base 10, this is equal to 2 times 10 to the power of negative 1 plus 5 times 10 to the power of negative 2. Simple enough. Then, to represent 0.25 in binary form, we can observe that its fractional form is 1 4th, or 2 to the power of negative 2. Thus, 0.25's binary form is actually 0.01. For harder values, say 1 over 10, where there's no immediate intuition, we can utilize the following algorithm. While the current number we're looking at is not equal to 0, step 1, we multiply the current number by 2. Step 2, if the result is greater than or equal to 1, then we represent that bit as a 1 and set the next number equal to the remainder of the result divided by 1. Step 3, if this new number is less than 1, then we represent that bit as a 0 and set the next number equal to the result. Step 4, we do this until we reach 0 or a repeated pattern. For our two examples, we can see how this algorithm plays out. For 1 over 4, step 1, we have 0 0.25 times 2 equals 0 0.5, which is less than 1, so we set the first bit to 0. Step 2, then we have 0 0.5 times 2, which is equal to 1, which is greater than or equal to 1, so we have the second bit to 1. Step 3, the remainder of 1 divided by 1 is 0, so we end our expression to get 0 0.01. For 1 over 10, it's slightly more complicated. Step 1, we have 0 0.1 times 2, which is 0 0.2, which is less than 1, so the first bit is 0. Step 2. We take 0 0.2 and multiply it by 2, which is 0 0.4, which is also less than 1, so the second bit is 0. Step 3. We do the same thing to get 0 0.8, which is also less than 1, so the third bit is 0. Step 4. We have 0 0.8 times 2, which is 1.6, which is greater than or equal to 1, so the fourth bit is 1. We now use 1.6 minus 1, which is 0 0.6. For step 5, we take that 0 0.6, multiply it by 2 to get 1.2, which is greater than or equal to 1, so the fifth bit is 1. We now use 1.2 minus 1, which is 0 0.2. For step 6, we'll notice that we're back at step 2, so the pattern repeats, and our binary representation of 1 10th is 0 0.00011001011, etc. It can be proven that every single reduced fraction has a unique binary form with this current algorithm. If you're wondering why, think about it this way. Every numerical value has a unique representation of base 10, it's just the number itself. If our algorithm takes those representations from base 10 and changes it up the way we read on paper, without actually changing the true numerical form, the uniqueness of all the number values are still there. This means if we had two numbers in base 2 that read differently but had the same base 10 value, it would contradict the fact that numbers themselves in base 10 could be different to begin with, which is an obvious impossibility. Using this information, the connection should then be clear. We should write our probability threshold of success in binary notation. Then, we can flip our simulated fair coin n times, where n is the number of unique bits in the binary expression of p, our threshold. Lastly, we want to somehow compare the outcome of the coin, heads being a 1 and tails being a 0, with the corresponding bit value in base 2 
representation of p. Defining some notation, suppose we have n flips. We can represent p in its binary representation as p equals 0 point p sub 1, p sub 2, p sub 3, etc. to p sub n, where there are n digits. This is equal to p sub 1 times 2 to the power of negative 1, plus p sub 2 times 2 to the power of negative 2, plus etc. all the way to p sub n times 2 to the power of negative n, where p sub i must be either a 0 or a 1 for all values of i equals 1 to n. Then the result of the ith coin flip can be represented by what side it landed on, or just si, where si must be 0 if the coin landed tails that flip, or 1 if it was heads. Once we start tossing our simulated coin, it's like we're building our own binary number. For each iteration, if si is less than the corresponding pi, we have 1, and we should stop flipping. Here, the game should return 1. If si is equal to pi, we should continue tossing coins. If si is greater than the corresponding pi, we have lost and we should stop flipping. Here, the game should return 0. Let's look at the intuition behind these cases. In the graph, we can see that we only return 1 if we're in this blue region. From the number line perspective, if we've guaranteed that our coin generated number is in this blue region, the game should return 1. Because each subsequent bit becomes smaller and smaller as the exponent of the 2 begins to get more negative and negative, if we ever hit a scenario where the coin flip's corresponding bit is less than what we're supposed to get, we've guaranteed that the overall number the coin flip will return must be less than the probability threshold we set for the game. Thus, the string built up by the coin flip's outcomes must also lie in the blue region, meaning with 1. Similarly, for the third outcome, our simulated coin flip bit being larger than the corresponding bit in the probability threshold means our simulated coin flip value must be strictly larger than p itself. Remember, we're building the simulated value iteratively, so to get to this point, we've had to have been matching only, which guarantees that in this scenario, this puts us in the red zone, i.e. we must return 0 and have lost the game. This of course brings us to the second scenario. If we just keep matching the most significant bits over and over between the coin simulated value and the probability threshold's corresponding bits, we don't actually know if the final value will be greater than or less than the threshold, so logically we have to keep going. Wait a minute, we just observed not a few minutes ago that we saw an example of a number that didn't have a finite binary representation, that being one tenth. So how would we deal with this? Well, that infinite binary representation would eventually have to cycle. We saw this in the example where the cycle length for one tenth was four bits long, 0011 over and over again. Since there's a chance we can mismatch, the probability that we will match all bits forever is zero, since we're guaranteed to find an error in the finite number of steps for an infinite sequence. So where does this leave us overall? We started with a random process in nature, say, whether lightning strikes on your left or your right. We don't know the probability of it occurring, but we do know that it has to be one or the other. Building off this, we are able to simulate a fair outcome from an unfair event. We classified the two equally probable scenarios as ones and zeros simulating bits. For example, lightning striking first on your left, then on your right, or first striking on your right, then on your left. While this worked naively, we soon realized the efficiency of using lightning storms to generate bits might be of slight concern, and thus turned to the multi-level strategy, maximizing the utility of each strike. Lastly, we took our ability to generate fair outcomes efficiently to generate predictably unfair outcomes. With this, we've effectively simulated the steps to building a functional computer. Is this still incredibly inefficient? Yes. Is it realistic to build a computer from nature? Probably not. Is it an amazing thought experiment though? Absolutely. So the next time you find yourself transported to ancient times, take a breath and flip a coin. If it's heads, you'll definitely leave your mark in history. Thank you so much for your support on my first video. I appreciate every single person who comments their feedback and will definitely try to acknowledge the time everyone gives, no matter how critical or supportive. This video is slightly more computational than the last one, so let me know down below if this is the type of content you're looking for. If you're curious on how I found this topic and want to read further, please read the linked lecture notes created by Harvard professor Michael Mitzenmacher, or check out the book referenced in the description. I really love the idea of growing this channel to keep exploring probability concepts in whimsical ways. If this sounds appealing to you, please feel free to subscribe and join me on this journey together. Hope to see you next time.